All right, Zechariah. We've got Malachi left. Lord willing, we, we will not meet next Sunday evening, but on the 8th, Lord willing, we will look at Malachi. We will close the Old Testament. 39 books. It's hard to believe that we've, we've made it through that much. We thank God for that. Uh, and all of that is to prepare. Remember the Puritans said, the new, speaking of the new covenant, the new Testament, the new is in the old concealed. The old is by the new revealed. I understood the interconnection that you can't separate the two uh, testaments. Turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 8. It should be fairly easy to find. All you've got to do is go to the end of the Old Testament and back up one. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3, and then Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. These are the two verses we will read. We will come back and see them as key verses a little later in our study. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read these two verses, and you're going to you're going to hear messianic overtones, and then you're going to see in the second one uh, something very familiar with Palm Sunday. Zechariah eight three, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. In chapter 9, verse 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's what happened when he entered Jerusalem in that last week. And they praised him and said, Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Karen told me in the, in the little children's Sunday school class this morning, they got out blankets and, and palm fronds that she had cut up, and, and they were placing them on the floor and waving the palm to reenact what must have been a powerful spectacle. When the people, not the religious leaders, <laughs> when the people recognized Jesus coming into Jerusalem in fulfillment, of the prophecy of Zechariah. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us from His Word tonight, help us to love Jesus more and to see the, see the precious value of how His Scripture weaves together inextricably. Thank you. Please be seated. I would simply remind you that the uh, theme passage, John 5, 39 and 40, I keep this before you. There's always a possibility someone may wander in and wonder, why, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you trying to tackle one book of the Bible every Sunday night? <clears throat> Jesus said, you search the Scriptures. He's chiding the religious leaders here. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. It's a, it, was a, it was quite an indictment on the religious leaders of the day. It is a warning to us that we not be someone who reads through the scriptures but doesn't see Jesus in them. Well, Zechariah <clears throat> manifests himself in the midst of a time when about a dozen years or more the task of building the temple has stood half completed. Zechariah is commissioned by God to encourage the people in the unfinished responsibility. Rather than exhorting them to action with strong words and rebuke, we saw that in, in Haggai last week, <clears throat> Zechariah seeks to encourage them to action by reminding them of the future importance of the temple, the, <clears throat> the role the temple would play in being rebuilt. In Jewish prophecy and history, when the temple was rebuilt, then Messiah would come. The temple must be built, for one day Messiah's glory will inhabit it. Zechariah made it plain that the future blessing is contingent upon their present obedience. That they could not look forward to what God had promised if they were not themselves willing to put themselves in, in the, in the uh, practical outworking of His providence. They're not simply building a building, they're building the future. So Zechariah tried to use that to motivate them. 
enter into the building project with wholehearted zeal for their Messiah was coming. Let's, uh, let's watch a video, the Bible Project video of Zechariah. The book of the prophet Zechariah. The book is set after the return of the exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem, and we're told in the book of Ezra that Zechariah and Haggai together challenged and motivated the people to rebuild the temple and look for the fulfillment of God's promises. Now long ago, Jeremiah the prophet had said that Israel's exile would last for 70 years, and that afterwards God would restore his presence to a new temple and bring his kingdom and the rule of the Messiah over all nations. The dates at the beginning of this book tell us that those 70 years are almost up. But life back in the land was hard, and it seemed like none of these promises were going to come true. Why? And the book of Zechariah offers an explanation. It has a fairly clear design. There's an introduction which sets the tone for a large collection of Zechariah's dream visions. And that's concluded by chapters 7 and 8. And then this is followed by two more large collections of poetry and prophecy. Let's just dive in and see how the book works. It begins with Zechariah's challenge to his generation to turn back to God and not be like their ancestors who rebelled and refused to listen to the earlier prophets, which landed them in exile. And so now the returned exiles respond positively to Zechariah. They repent and humble themselves before God, or so it seems. The next large section is a collection of eight nighttime visions that Zechariah experienced. And just to prepare you, these are full of very bizarre, strange images, a lot like your dreams. The idea that God communicates to people through symbolic dreams, it's very old. It goes back to the book of Genesis. The dreams of Jacob or Joseph or Pharaoh, these gave meaning to current events at the time, but they also gave a window into the future. And so Zechariah has his own dreams now, and they've been arranged in this really cool symmetrical design. The first and the last visions are about four horsemen each. They're like rangers patrolling the world on God's behalf, and it's a representation of God's attentive watch over the nations. Their report is that the world is at peace. And in Zechariah's day, this refers to how God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon and bring peace. And so the question now arises, the 70 years of Israel's exile are almost up. Is now the time for the Messianic kingdom in Jerusalem? And God responds by saying that he's determined to fulfill those promises, but he leaves the question of timing unanswered. The second and seventh visions are paired because they're both reflections on Israel's past sin that led up to the exile. So the second vision is about these horns that symbolize the nations that attacked and then scattered Israel, Assyria and Babylon. But then these horns or empires are themselves scattered by a group of blacksmiths, an image for Persia. The seventh dream is about a woman in a basket, and we're told that she's a symbol of the centuries of Israel's covenant rebellion. And then this woman is carried off to Babylon by other women who carry the basket flying with stork wings. This is so strange. The third and sixth visions are paired as they're both about the rebuilding of a new Jerusalem. So a man is measuring the city. It's an image of God's promise that Jerusalem will be rebuilt and become a beacon to the nations who will join God's people in worship. And then the sixth dream is about a scroll that flies around the new Jerusalem punishing thieves and liars. The idea being that the new Jerusalem is a place that's purified from sin by the scriptures. The fourth and fifth visions are at the center of this collection, and they're about the two key leaders among the returned exiles. So Joshua, the high priest, and then Zerubbabel, the royal descendant of David. So Joshua had been symbolically wearing Israel's sin in the form of these dirty clothes, but then those are taken off, and he's given new clothes and a new turban, a symbol of God's grace and forgiveness. And then an angel tells Joshua that if he remains faithful to God, he will lead his people, and Joshua will become a symbol of the future messianic king. The other vision is about two olive trees that supply oil to this elaborate gold lamp, which itself is a symbol of God's watchful eye over his people. And these two trees symbolize the two anointed leaders, Joshua and then Zerubbabel, who is leading the temple rebuilding efforts. And God says that success will not come to this new temple if it's the result only of political maneuvering. Rather, these two leaders must be dependent upon the work of God's Spirit. 
The visions come to a close with a bonus vision from the prophet, and it picks up the themes of the central fourth and fifth visions. It's Joshua, the high priest again, and he's given a crown and presented as a symbol of the future Messiah, who will also be a priest over God's kingdom. And then Zechariah closes it all out, saying that all of these visions will be fulfilled only if the current generation is faithful to God and obeys the terms of the covenant. And so altogether, these three visions emphasize how the coming of the messianic kingdom is conditional upon this generation being faithful to God, which leads to the conclusion of the dreams. It's another challenge from Zechariah, and a group of Israelites come, and they've been mourning over the former temple's destruction for nearly 70 years. And they ask him, is it time to stop grieving? I mean, is God's kingdom going to come very soon? And Zechariah again reminds them of how their ancestors rejected God's call through the prophets, which led to the exile. And so he challenges them too. He says, this generation will see the messianic kingdom only if they pursue justice and peace and remain faithful to the covenant. So in other words, Zechariah reverses their question. He asks, are you going to become the kind of people who are ready to receive and participate in God's coming kingdom? And that question is left just hanging there. The people don't answer, and the book just moves on. And so we come to the final sections that are very different from chapters 1 to 8. Each section is a kaleidoscopic collage of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. So the first one, chapters 9 to 11, describe the coming of the humble messianic king who's riding a donkey into the new Jerusalem to establish God's kingdom over the nations. But then, all of a sudden, this king, he's symbolized as a shepherd over the flock of Israel, and then he's rejected first by his own people, but then also by their leaders, who are also symbolized as shepherds. And so God hands Israel over to these corrupt shepherds, and it raises the question, will Israel's rejection of their king last forever? In the final section, chapters 12 to 14, say no. It's another mosaic of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. And they depict the new Jerusalem as a place where God's justice will finally confront and defeat evil among the nations. It's very similar to the same themes in prophet Joel or Ezekiel. But then God also will confront the rebellion within the hearts of his own people. He's going to pour out his spirit on them, he says, so that they can repent and grieve over the fact that they have rebelled and rejected their messianic shepherd. The final chapter concludes with the new Jerusalem as the gathering point for all of the nations. And then this city becomes a new Garden of Eden, and there's a river of living water flowing out of the temple, bringing healing to all of creation, and that's how the book ends. And so Zechariah just leaves you to ponder the connection between chapters 1 through 8 and 9 to 14. And the point seems to be that this future messianic kingdom of the book's second half will only come when God's people are faithful to the covenant, the point of the first half. Reading the book of Zechariah is a wild ride. These visions and poems are full of startling imagery, and they do not follow a linear flow of thought. And that's part of the point. It's like history and our lives. It doesn't always fit into neat, orderly patterns. But the prophets offer us glimpses of God's hand at work, guiding history towards his own purposes. And so ultimately, Zechariah invites us to look above the chaos and hope for the coming of God's kingdom, which should motivate faithfulness in the present. And that's what the book of Zechariah is all about. Another good summary. I hope you uh, are having occasion to relate back to uh, these videos on YouTube and watch them. They're just, they're very good, concise graphic. He uses a couple of tools there to not only let you hear what it's about, but see what it's about. And I think it helps you to, to get a handle on the books a little better. Um, we'll do a survey outline like we typically do and then I want to speak a little more to that of, of this prophecy of Zechariah. If we put it into a time frame, we're looking at 520 to 518 BC for the first uh, couple of portions of it. Uh, this is while the temple's being built. And then the last portion you would put you, uh, into the, like 480 to 470 BC after the building, after the temple has been built. The place that takes place in Jerusalem uh, in his prophecies. It is made up of eight visions, four messages, and two burdens to these, these, these heavy, uh, heavy-hearted messages from the Lord. 
the eight visions uh, take up pictures of Israel's fortune. Uh, they include a call to repentance. We're going to read that in a moment in, in the first part of, of uh, chapter one. Uh, then this crowning of Joshua, what, what our video calls a bonus vision, the crowning of Joshua uh, in 6, 9 through 6, 15. Then there's four messages. The, uh, these address the problems, uh, calling Israel to fast, uh, questions concerning the feast. And then these two burdens finish out the uh, the prophecy, chapter 9, verse 1, all the way to the end of 14, have predictions to them about Israel's future. The first burden is, uh, takes up a rejection of the Messiah. The second burden, the reign, the coming reign of Messiah. So, so let's look at, at this as it unfolds here. These first eight chapters are written to encourage the remnant that is, that is there while they're rebuilding the temple. The last six chapters, written after the completion of the temple, to provoke the people of God to anticipate Israel's coming Messiah. One writer said this, he said that Zechariah moves from, from Gentile domination to Messianic rule, from persecution that they've received to peace that will come with the Messiah from an uncleanness as a mark of their generation to holiness. That's the, that's the movement he's, he's challenging them to undertake. And so when you look at, the, uh, at these visions, uh, let's look at, at Zechariah 1, 1 to 6 to see how the book opens. And then we'll look just briefly at the visions because uh, I want to get the, to the messianic implications of this book, which is replete with those. Zechariah 1.1, 1, 1. <clears throat> in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edo, saying, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out, thus says the Lord of hosts. Return from your evil ways, from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. Notice in this passage, just... This Lord of hosts keeps coming up. If you, if you look at that in the Hebrew, it, it, Hebrew, it is, it is Jehovah Sabaoth. Not Sabbath, Sabaoth. Jehovah Sabaoth is the, is the captain of the armies of heaven and earth. He's, when he speaks in these, these images, and remember now, these people have been in captivity. Some have begun to return to rebuild the temple. But he's reminding them that he is the God of all the armies. And he can turn armies to fight for his people and defeat the enemies, or he can take up armies to defeat his people because he owns them all. And so it's interesting to me that over and over this designation, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts. And then you get into the visions. These visions mix both uh, the work of Messiah in his first coming and the work of Messiah in his second coming. And, and they only give us peaks. They're not, they're not designed to dig deep down. They're, they're pointing out peaks of, of what they can anticipate. Because remember, Zechariah is, is exhorting or, or encouraging these people to get about the business of finishing the temple because it, it ties into God's redemptive history. You see in this, and this is, it's, a, it's hard to wrap your mind around it because we think in terms of, of God's intention to accomplish his covenant, an unconditional unilateral covenant, but he does speak to them. If you're not careful, have you ever known people who say they believe in the sovereignty of God and their belief in the sovereignty of God seems to make them lazy and uncaring? You ever know, I've, I've known people like that. I've known people. That's not what it's designed to do. God's sovereignty is, is, is hand in hand with man's responsibility. God accomplishes his purpose through means. Someone asked Spurgeon one time, would you reconcile for us, please, the sovereignty of God 
and the responsibility of man? Spurgeon's answer was, of course not. I never reconcile friends. They fit very nicely together in the scripture. They're both true. And so what you, you see this fleshed out in Zechariah, all these ifs, ifs, ifs. This is coming. If, if you obey, if you're faithful to my covenant, if, if, if. And so it shows us not that we control the future of God's plan, but that we need to see ourselves as a part of the accomplishing of God's plan. And that's what you're going to see in Zechariah. So the first vision, verse 5, are visions of comfort. Now the last three of the warning of judgment. The first vision is the horseman among the myrtle trees. And we find this, he, he's going he's to help. He will rebuild Zion and his people. That's what if you read verses 7 to 17 in chapter 1, that's what you're going to see. The second vision is about four horns and the craftsmen. You saw that on the video, the four horns of the, of the, of the nations that had overtaken God's people, and then the craftsmen who come and they represent Persia to uh, rescue them from their captors. Israel's oppressors will be judged, Zechariah 1, 18 to 21. The third vision is the man with a, with a measuring line. God will protect and glorify Jerusalem. He's measuring it, which means if he's measuring it, there is a future there. There are plans for it, Zechariah 2, 1 to 13. The fourth is the cleansing of Joshua, the high priest. It, in such a way, Israel will be cleansed and restored by the coming branch. Joshua, and of course you would know this, this wouldn't surprise you. Joshua is the Hebrew for Yahushua, which means uh, God is my salvation. Joshua is the Hebrew Old, equivalent, Old, Old Testament equivalent of the New Testament uh, Greek, Jesus. Remember Matthew 1, 21, call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. And so you have this foreshadowing in Joshua of the coming of Messiah. Then the fifth uh, vision is the golden lampstand. God's spirit is empowering Zerubbabel, who's the governor, remember, and Joshua. Then these last three, six, seven, and eight are, are judgment. Individual sin will be uh, accomplished, will be, will be judged, I mean. The uh, the seventh one, the woman in the basket, national sin will be removed. So there's, there's this warning that God, as he challenges them, you must participate. You must do the responsible thing. He also warns of consequences if they don't. And then the eighth vision, the four chariots, God's judgment will descend on the nations. And then I want us to look at, at chapter 6, verses 9 to 15, the crowning of this Joshua, uh, the high priest. Look at chapter 6, verse 9. And the word of the Lord came to me, take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, Jedidiah, Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. That's one of the designations of Messiah. For he shall branch out from his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam, Tabijah, Jediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. What do you see here? Joshua, the high priest, is given a crown. Jesus, remember, is prophet, priest, and king. We've looked at that. That's in the catechism, if, you, if you're working on the catechism. He teaches the will of God comes forth teaching. He sacrifices on behalf of the people and prays for them in his high priestly role. And he rules over and defends them. So you have this blending together, this unusual. You go back and look in, in Israel's history, you don't see a high priest being crowned, nor do you see a crown taking on the role of priesthood. This is a powerful anticipation of the Messiah who will blend the two in one. And so it anticipates the coming of the branch. 
who will be a king and a priest. I would, if you know your, uh, your Melchizedek history in Hebrews, of course in Genesis as well, you know that Melchizedek is this king who appears sort of out of nowhere. We don't know anything about him, uh, but his name is Hebrew made up from Melchus, which is king, and Zedek, which is righteousness. Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. He rules over Salem, Shalom, which is the Hebrew for, for peace. And we find out that this Melchizedek is a king and a priest. He's, a, he's an early anticipation. But we don't know anything about him. We don't know where he came from. The fact that it says he has no beginning, he has no end. It's, it's, a, it's language used to, to uh, give us a glimpse at Messiah who has always been when he comes. So you have that, that powerful picture. Then you move from the eight visions to the four messages, chapter 7 and 8. A question is posed. Look at seven, chapter 7, uh, verses 1 to 3. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Chislev. Now the people of Bethel had sent Sherezar and Regum Melech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts, and to the prophets, should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? In other words, should we fast or should we feast? Should we fast or should we feast? And so these four messages that the prophet Zechariah gives are in response to that. Uh, he rebukes them in chapter four verses, chapter seven, verses four to seven for what he would call empty ritualism. He reminds them of the history of disobedience Chapter 7, verses 8 to 14. He exhorts them concerning the restoration and consolation of Israel. Chapter 8. And then the recovery of joy in the kingdom. And so he, he answers this question with these four messages that you find spelled out that take us through uh, the end of chapter 8. And then you have these two burdens uh, that come up in chapters 9 to 14. The first burden in, in Zechariah 9 to 11 concerns the first coming of Jesus and the rejection of Israel's coming king. Uh, Alexander the Great will conquer Israel's neighbors but will spare Jerusalem. Look at Zechariah 9, 1 to 8. The oracle of the word of God is against the land of Hadrach and Damascus is its resting place. For the Lord has an eye on mankind and all the tribes of Israel and on Hamath also which borders on it. Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. Tyre has built herself a rampart and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like the mud of the streets. But behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions and strike down her power on the sea. She shall be devoured by fire. Ashkelon shall see it and be afraid. Gaza too and shall writhe in anguish. Ekron also because its hopes are confounded. The king shall perish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall be uninhabited. A mixed people shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of Philistia. I will take away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. It too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah. Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. Then I will encamp at my house as a guard, so that none shall march to and fro. No oppressor shall again march over them. For now I see with my own eyes. These, this, this powerful imagery here that God will use a foreign conqueror to trample underfoot the enemies of his people but spare Jerusalem in the midst of it. It will be preserved for her king. And if you know your history you know that, that Israel would succeed against the, the Greece when Greece comes to rule. In the history that's called the Maccabean, the, the revolt of the Maccabees. It's in the inter intertestamental period. And be scattered later on, but the Messiah will bless them and bring them back. The, the Jews of what's called the diaspora, the diaspora means the dispersion, would bring them back. Zechariah 10, 1 speaks of that. But Israel will reject her shepherd king. That's in Zechariah 11, 4 to 17. So that's the, that's the substance of the first, what's called the first burden. The second burden concerns the second coming of the Messiah. 
and his acceptance as Israel's king. The nations will attack Jerusalem, but the Messiah will come and deliver his people. That's Zechariah 12. They will be cleansed of impurity and falsehood, Zechariah 13. And the Messiah will come in power to judge the nations and reign in Jerusalem over the whole earth, Zechariah 14. So the, the prophecy ends with a great crescendo. I would encourage you, if you haven't read it, read Zechariah 14, this great wave after wave of, of, of God being victorious through his Messiah. So when we think about the, uh, the title of this book, Zechar Yah. If you could read this in Hebrew, it's Zechar Yah. And that means God remembers or God has remembered. It's a great name to remind them of God's covenant faithfulness. When, when you read this, by the way, you know this. But it doesn't mean that God had forgotten. It's, it's that he, he wants them to know it's not off his mind. He's, he's mindful of his covenant promises, even though things may look dark. So much so that they would ask, what do we do? Do we feast or do we fast? We don't, we don't know where we are. And God is, 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 or is it over for us or what? And this theme dominates the whole book. Israel will be blessed because God remembers his covenant that he made with their father Abraham. If you look for the Greek or Latin name of this, by the way, just, it's, it's Zechariah. Zechariah. This, the author, Zechariah, whose name means God remembers, was a popular name. And this, this, I found this interesting. Shared by no fewer than 29 Old Testament characters. You'll find this name pop up 29 times with people. So it's a very popular name to, to name a child as a sort of a testimony of hope that God, God has not forgotten his people. God will remember, he will act on our behalf. Like his predecessors, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Zechariah was a, a priestly lineage. We read that in chapter 1 of the son of Berechiah, who was a priest, and the grandson of Edo. I just want to look at some, we've already read the, uh, Zechariah 1, 1, and 7, but I want us to see uh, these other occurrences. Look at, uh, let me see here, Ezra 5, 1. So we're going back a ways. Look at Ezra 5.1. Now the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, so he's really grandson there, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God, of the God of Israel, who was over them. Then again, Ezra uh, chapter 6, verse 14. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So you see the occurrence again. Then, then Nehemiah 12, look over there just to see how historically this, this was chronicled. Nehemiah 12, verse 4. We'll pick up uh, in verse 1. These are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, Sariah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Maloch, Hattush, Shechaniah, Rehum, Merimoth, Edo, Genethoi, Abijah, Mijaman, Maadiah, Bilgah, Shemaiah, Joyarib, Jediah, Salu, Amak, Hilkiah, Jedidiah. These were the chief priests, chief of the priests, and of the brothers of the days of Jeshua. This is reference to, to Edo there. And then look at, <clears throat> excuse me, Nehemiah 12, 16. Again, a, a genealogical list. I won't uh, challenge my tongue or your ears. Jump into verse 16. Of Edo, Zechariah. So it's telling us that Zechariah was involved in this too, his lineage tracing back to Edo. He was born in Babylon and was brought back by his grandfather to Palestine when the Jewish exiles returned under Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. 
was probably about, uh, at an early age, 520 B.C. is when he was called to prophesy. Then there's some Jewish uh, history that's outside the Bible. Jewish tradition says Zechariah was a member of the great synagogue that collected and preserved the canon of revealed scripture. So he would have, his responsibilities would have been to, to maintain, uh, keep safe, and study uh, the scriptures that had already been uh, canonized. And then Matthew 23, 35 references him as being murdered between the temple and the altar in the same way uh, that an earlier first person named Zechariah had been martyred. So the, the testimony internally in the scriptures and external in Jewish tradition uh, affirms Zechariah is the author of this entire book. When you try to date it, uh, Zechariah, we told you last week, was a younger contemporary of Haggai the prophet. He operated in the time of Zerubbabel the governor and Joshua the high priest. And so you have some key players at this time in, uh, in the return of Israel and, and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. In chapters 1 through 8, the historical setting is 520 to 518 B.C. It's identical to that of Haggai. We looked at that last week. Work was resumed on the temple in 520 B.C. and the project was completed 516 B.C. Chapters 9 to 14 are harder to date. But experts suggest a date between 480 and 470 B.C., which would mean that Darius I had passed from the scene and that he'd been succeeded by Xerxes, the king who deposed Queen Vashti, just for historical context, and made Esther queen of Persia. The theme, as we've told you, is the, is the uh, preparation and anticipation of the coming of Messiah. A lot of emphasis on that, and you're going to see this uh, when we get into seeing Jesus in this. First eight chapters frequently allude to the temple, encouraging people to complete their work. It was their future. They were to respond to Yahweh's covenant faithfulness. This was to be a provocation to them that he remembers he's, he's, he's going to fulfill, but you, but you must, you, if you, What are some keys to Zechariah? Well, the key phrase is preparation for the Messiah. We use that in our, in our title tonight. Key verses we've already looked at. We'll read them again. Zechariah 8, 3, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. It's the idea there that, that the city will be recognized as faithful, the mountain recognized as holy, is that God is moving something is significantly changing. Of course, we know in chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Seemed unusual when it was said. <clears throat> but when the day that you and I recognize as Palm Sunday occurred, it had, to, it had to really stir the people and completely jam the frequencies of the religious leaders. Here is one, knowingly or unknowingly, and of course we, we know that he knew, knowingly or unknowingly who is fleshing out what was prophesied by Zechariah coming to his people in a very humble way. The key chapter, as I've already alluded, is chapter 14. There's a tremendous climax. In this chapter, Zechariah disc discloses the last siege of Jerusalem, the initial victory of the enemies of Israel, the cleaving of the Mount of Olives, the Lord's defense of Jerusalem with his visible appearance on Olivet, judgment on the confederated nations, the topo topographical changes in the land of Israel, the Feast of Tabernacles in the Millennium, and the ultimate holiness of Jerusalem and her people. So you have this, this term we've used proleptic before, prophecy, this near, near the moment and ultimate fulfillment of Messiah. Now, so where do we see Jesus in Zechariah? Well, we know in, in, in Joshua, the priest, a powerful prefiguring of the Messiah.
As we've alluded, Christ is portrayed in His two comings, His first coming and His second coming, as both a servant and king, and as a man and God. It's all there. And the religious leaders who, who studied the Old Testament, who mined and, and, and combed through the law and the prophets, books of history, poetic writers, did not see it. When you read Zechariah carefully, you see that, that there is this servant and king portrayed. There is this one who seems to be both God and man portrayed. So we're just going to give you some of the of the flavor. I would encourage you, if you haven't read Zechariah, to read it sometime this week and read it with an eye to seeing these pictures of Jesus. First of all, there's this, this picture of the angel of the Lord. Look at Zechariah 3, 1 and 2. Get over there. Back over there. Zechariah 3, 1 and 2. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Remember, this word angel is the word, uh, can be actually describing an angelic winged being, but is also the word for messenger. The messenger, one of the descriptions of Jesus, he's the messenger of the Lord, the messenger of the covenant. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And of course, this is when the, the scene, of course, when, when Joshua will ultimately put on uh, priestly garments. Then there's this in, in the same chapter, chapter 3, verse 9, the stone with seven eyes. So you see Jesus in the, the picture of the angel of the Lord. Let's drop in at, at chapter 3, verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant, the branch. Again, that's another description of Messiah. For behold, on the stone that I have set before you, Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes. The, if you know your, your Hebrew... Uh, Numbers, seven is one of the numbers of completion. This all-seeing eye talks about. I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. And that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine, under his fig tree. One of the things, one of the features of, of Zechariah is this great hopefulness that when Messiah arrives, that he will not just bless the Jews, but he will bless all through his blessing upon his people. This is one of those pictures. This, this branch who is the all-seeing one will make things right uh, for God's glory. God's justice. Then we get this picture in chapter 6, verse 13, of the king priest. Look at this. Again, we'll pick up, we want to maintain context. And I, I read this earlier about Joshua, but listen to, this, listen to it with, with lenses to see Jesus. We'll drop in at verse 12. You say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, all right? This comes up over and over. Branch, he is the one, uh, the shoot who will come out of the dry ground. He is the branch of Jesse, son of David. For he shall branch out from this place, and he shall build a temple, the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and, share, and shall bear royal honor, shall sit and rule on his throne. There's the indication right there. The branch of Jesse will sit on the throne. Remember now, this is at a time when they had lost all of that. And now it's being restored in the rebuilding of the temple. Lost any hope, any visible hope that there would, there would always be someone to sit on David's throne. Always be a son of David 
on David's throne. And yet here we're speaking about that, that eventuality. And there shall be a priest on his throne. There's the combination of the, of the kingly priest uh, anticipation of Messiah. Then chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, the humble king. We read this, this earlier. This blending uh, being very unusual. You would expect a king to be powerful and ruthless. But in the first coming, in the incarnation, Jesus comes saying, I am meek and lowly in heart. And he, distrib- he demonstrates that powerfully on Palm Sunday when he comes riding in, not on a, on a white horse, not in a chariot with, a, with someone behind him uh, showing him obeisance, but comes humbly, comes humbly. The humble king is presented. Then in Zechariah 10, 4, the cornerstone, uh, the tent peg, the bow of battle. Look at this. We'll pick up in verse 3. My anger is hot against the shepherds. I will punish the leaders for the Lord of hosts cares for his flock. This is when, when, they're, when the false shepherds have come and they've turned their back on, on God. The Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic steed in battle. From him shall come the cornerstone. Get the picture? Jesus alludes to this. He's the cornerstone. Peter picks up on it in, in his writings in the New Testament. He's a stone that the builders rejected. Stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and yet he's God's cornerstone. From him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler, all of them together. They should be like mighty men in battle, trampling the foe in the mud. In other words, he will be a victorious Messiah. He will come, put all the enemies of God under his feet, and he will anchor the tent peg. At one point in Jeremiah, you have this, expand the borders of your tents. And you read that passage, it's talking about how how the, the day is coming when 10 men will lay hold of the skirt of the Jews saying, let us go with you, for we've heard that God is with you. It's a great picture of what's, what some call the latter rain, the great in gathering that will take place in the last days. He's the good shepherd who's rejected and sold for 30 shekels of silver, the price of a slave. Look at Zechariah 11 verses four to 13. Thus says the Lord, my God, become shepherd of the flock, doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them, slaughter them, go unpunished. And those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord, I become rich. In other words, he's talking about the false shepherds getting, getting uh, fat and wealthy off of the sheep. And their own shepherds have no pity on them. For I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. Behold, I will cause each of them to fall into the hand of his neighbor, each into the hand of his king. They shall crush the land, and I will deliver none from their hand. So I became the shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered by the shepherd traders. And I took two staffs, one I named Favor, the other I named Union. And I tended the sheep. In one month I destroyed the three shepherds, but I became impatient with them. They also detested me. So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. I took my staff favor and broke it. In other words, God's favor is gone. Annulling the covenant that I had made with all the peoples. So it was annulled on that day, and the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as many wages, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it, throw it to the potter. Does that sound familiar to you? Potter's field, the New Testament. The lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver, threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Then I broke my second staff, union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. The Lord said to me, take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I'm raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed or seek the, the young or heal the, the maimed or nourish the healthy but devours the flesh. So this is this, this back and forth with God having a controversy with those who were leading falsely in his name and yet not leading people to him. And so there's this, there's this figure that comes up, 30 pieces of silver. 
thrown into the house of the Lord to the, to the potter. It's very reminiscent of what would happen when Jesus is betrayed by Judas. Then he's the pierced one. Look at Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. Uh, other renderings and a spirit of grace and supplication, begging the Lord for mercy. So that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Powerful image of, of looking upon the one they pierced, the firstborn, God's only child. These powerful pictures. Then there's this cleansing fountain in Zechariah 13, 1. On that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. You ever wondered? Uh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. It's, it's powerful imagery in, in hymnody based upon this picture of Jesus being the cleansing fountain. They will be cleansed from sin and uncleanness. And it will come uh, at the expense of his life. The smitten shepherd who's abandoned. Look at Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus cites this. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and perish and one third shall be left alive. I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver. Test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. And so this, this smiting of the shepherd, the scattering of the sheep, and yet he will, he will retain, rescue, a remnant. And then the whole 14th chapter of this coming judge and this righteous king. Look, just look at the early part of it, behold, chapter 14. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. The Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives that shall be split in two from east to west. So this figure of the Lord descending, the covenant God descending to fight on behalf of his people after they have been ravaged by their enemies. And it, and it goes on and on. Look at verse 8. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem. We've seen that image before as we studied through, through the prophets, this picture of of the city of God being a place where when it's purified, waters will, will, will nourish the earth from there. The Lord, verse 9, the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So we just read on down. Look at verse 29. Oh, pardon me, verse 20. And on that day, there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord. The pots in the houses of the house of the Lord shall be as the bowls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. There shall no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. The picture, the common vessels. This is a very powerful picture here. Because there were sanctified vessels that were only to be used. And yet, the Lord says, on that day, when even on the, when the horses move, think about the imagery here. When the horses are moving and the bells on their bridles are chiming, what is on them is holy to the Lord. The holiness of God descending. Because His, His Messiah has come. The common things which it would have been wrong to use in sacrifice, made holy. 
by the coming of God's anointed. So you have this, these powerful pictures, and there's, there's just, we don't have time to go through all of them tonight. I just encourage you to read Zechariah and look for these images of Jesus. And then what about, we've, all, we've asked all with, with through this, what contribution do you have? What, what contribution does Zechariah make what, uh, to the whole canon of Scripture? I told you at the outset, he's called the major minor prophet. The longest of all the minor prophets. Replete with messianic passages. The book contains visions and messages and oracles. It really comes as a counterpart to, to Daniel, the history of Israel during Gentile domination. Daniel speaks of God's prophetic plan for the Gentiles. We told you that Haggai and Zechariah ministered together in motivating the remnant to build the second temple. Their approaches were different though. I just want to give you uh, some contrast. Haggai used really that stern warning of exhortation. Zechariah uses encouragement. The temple represents your future. The temple represents your, your obedience to God. Haggai's descriptions were more concrete than Zechariah's. Zechariah's, as, you, as we've read them tonight, there's more abstract to them. Haggai, much more concise, smaller. Zechariah, 14 chapters. He expands uh, his, his word from the Lord. Haggai warns them of what's, what's going to happen now. Zechariah points them to a future. And one writer, I saw this, I like this, he said, Haggai's challenge was take part. In other words, pick up and build. Zechariah was take heart, be encouraged at what is coming. Zech Haggai was an older uh, fellow who was very, uh, very intense and earnest. Zechariah was something of a younger visionary with all of his visions. And that's, that's a little bit of a snapshot of seeing how we see Jesus in this wonderful prophecy as we come close to the end of the Old Testament. And, and in just a few weeks, we'll be then gazing into the New Testament at the birth of Jesus and what we learn in the prophet, in, in, in the, in the uh, gospels and the acts and the epistles. Questions or comments?